formal. So here's a little poem called Harry the Waiter. There's a tiny story with this. I used to go to Chinatown because I lived close by. And you know, I was an adjunct faculty member in about 80 places. I had no money. And I would go down to this one um, Chinese restaurant where I had kind of made friends with a man named Harry who was a waiter. And uh, he would also, he would always say, how much do you have? And so I would give him a number and he'd bring me things. And this went on for years, even after I had some money. I would bring like 19 people and he'd, I'd say, what can I get for $3 a piece? He would come with a feast, you know, it was just amazing. The waiter. Harry was the oldest person working there. He waited tables by the kitchen door, and like an uncle hovering near, he offered something special, something more. No matter what item he tried to plug, I always drew the line at sea cucumber, in other words, or ideogram, a slug. He never ma wavered, nor did he ever remember one visit to the next, the only price we could afford for the dinner a symbol. The decor was wild, the setting very nice in the part of Chinatown that actually resembled the nooks and alleys of a city like Shanghai, where French and Chinese architecture made a blend of street and sky that shows up best in dreams and not brochures. Where but here, a dragon totem pole a block away from Mandarin Plaza. Where but here, a bill for the whole crowd that drove the owner Gaga. I learned to order and eat the real daily fare of my neighbors, China South. And Harry was my guide for how to feel the pride of getting nouns inside my mouth for Buddha's feast, for thank you and goodbye. He's in my memory like a scholar painter, inking up his brush and looking at the sky, waiting for bamboo and breath to center. Oh, those were the days. Actually, the first time um, Colleen and I ever went to dinner together with my parents, that's the restaurant we went to. And my father had such a hard time dealing with Colleen being there. He was literally spinning the plates. We, we could tell he was not quite sure what to do next. OK. Um, this is a poem entitled, After Having Broken Into Blossom. And I was um, impelled to write this after reading um, James Wright's poem about the ponies out in the pasture. And um, it's a poem that I take a look at someday. And having broken into blossom, there is no against, just to and fro. And where before I wondered what and why, now I shyly bend and blend into the sensible breeze. If there were anything more to say than this pink of pink of pink that I am would be answer enough. Um, I've been working on a project that I thought was going to be a book, but now I think it's just going to be a project about um, I was entitling it A Year in a Chinese Garden because I've been studying Chinese brush painting for a long time. But I don't think I'm going to be going there. I might be going somewhere else. But that being said, uh, I learned a tremendous amount by studying um, Chinese brush painting. And I have a poem entitled The Immortals. There are eight immortals, but... Um, I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to tell you this little poem about them and us. Something like the apostles, maybe, but a cloud of images and a clattering of cups. Such would be the scene and setting for some old poets to meet and sing some songs. Let me add a woman poet or two and the gallantry possible among equals. Let me set this in my time and some place familiar to contemporary friends. A day in Griffith Park, 
a picnic on the grass near Dodger Stadium, some short races across the meadow, and when the evening comes, a couple of guitars, a little drum, poets reciting favorite poems by heart. There are lots of depictions of um, brush painters in the paintings that they did, all of them hanging out together and looking at scrolls that have been painted. And I thought that might be something that many people who have some art form and share it, uh, share it with other friends in that form could identify with. Hmm. Who speaks Spanish? Okay, I, I need to know, if I were gonna say, listen, if I were saying that to you, listen, what would the form be? Is it escuche or escucha? Escucha, thank you. We had a discussion about it this morning and our Spanish is about you know six months old or eight, so we couldn't quite. After many years, yes, uh -huh. it, it, uh, it doesn't grow big enough to go to school. <laughs> Escucha mi vida. Entonces, my life, you were a leaf on a cecropia, a breathing leaf, a sun shield, a mother to the branch, to the trunk, to the root. The tanager pushed you aside for the fruit. The wind pushed you, the rain bent you low. Listen, my life, you were falling against a blue sky. You, a brown curl, loose in the air, done with that lifetime on a stem, done with the green branch, now down to the rocking current, a new boat sliding between the dark stones and the light stones, finding the open V and sailing across the swell of the current. My life, I saw you go by from the freshly painted green bridge over the beautiful quebrada where I stepped from the forest into a patch of sun. I wrote that one in Costa Rica. Oops. Oh, here's another one that I wrote in Costa Rica, but at a different time. It's called The Last Breakup. Maybe if she hadn't dyed her hair purple, and if she'd gone to class when I dropped her off each day, then maybe she wouldn't have gotten a heroin habit and completely crashed your car. If she hadn't gone to jail, and if you hadn't had to call your ex-husband to meet you at the lockup, and if I had been the one in family therapy with you for three months instead of him, then maybe you would have seen her talk to me the way she talked in the car on the way to school. Her hair, glossy as a grackle, back combed on the top, nape shaved, a perfectly crafted, punked out geisha teen. If you had seen her talk to me, then you would have known I was her family and not one like the frightened flock Bernie and you and her sister made or the one your mother had in mind when she told you you need a man to take care of you. If you didn't take that advice so to heart, then you would have heard her talk to me about me moving in with you. And if she hadn't painted her bedroom black and ruined the apartment so that your lease went bust and you had to move, maybe you wouldn't have said she had to live with her dad and the so-called bitch who smoked dope all day. If she didn't find heroin, then maybe she wouldn't have felt superior to that stoner stepmom and had to run away because there was no home with you to go to. If she had had a home, maybe she wouldn't have needed a motorcycle to make you mad at her even more and find my defense of her tedious. And if I had been a man, I would have said to you, calm down, and you would have believed me. Instead, you said you had to find a man to be normal again and wanted me to make that 
all right. But by then, I was so bereft, as if my chest had been unbuttoned in a blizzard, I couldn't say that it was fine for you to go away, to believe that mother of yours whose boyfriend was hit by the mob. If you had just let me attend family counseling, and if you had heard your daughter talk to me, I think we had a home to make. I did. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end here with a poem. Yeah, this one. I'm going to end here with a poem um, that touches upon breast cancer because this month is um, a month in which um, all kinds of focus are being put on breast cancer and still attempting to find some kind of a cure. This is called The Beach at Sunset. I should tell you a little tiny story about this poem. Um, I taught writing for many years at Cal State Northridge, creative writing, and mm, people would always write these really horrible love poems about the beach at sunset. And I would always immediately, the first day of class, say, no poems about the beach at sunset, okay? I don't want to hear it. It is not interesting. I know all of them. <laughs> love found, love lost, whatever, love drowned. I know them all. And then one time I said to myself, well, if I'm so obstreperous about it, maybe I should try and see if I can do one myself that isn't terrible. <laughs> The Beach at Sunset, and this is a poem for Colleen. The cliff above where we stand is crumbling, and up on the palisades, the sidewalks buckle like a broken conveyor belt. Art Deco palm trees sway their hula skirts in perfect uniform against a, black, a background of gorgeous blue. And for you, I would try it though I have always forbidden myself to write poems about the beach at sunset. All the cliches for it sputter like the first generation of neon, and what attracts me anyway are these full four species of gulls we've identified, their bodies turned into the wind and not one of them aware of their silly beauty. I'm the one awash in pastels, and hoping to salvage the day, finally turning away from the last light on the western shore. We walk and the steady whoosh of waves drumming in, drumming insistently like the undeniable data of the cancer in your breast. We walk back to the car and take the top down for the ride home through the early mist. No matter what else is happening, this is California. You'll have your cancer at freeway speeds. I'll drive and park and drive and park. The hospital, when I arrive to visit, will be catching the last rays of the sun, glinting like an architectural miracle realized. I realize a miracle is what you need. A grain of sand, a perfect world, where you live beyond the facts of what your body has given you as the first taste of death. And how many years is it? 1995. Yeah. So you see, it can be done, 1995. I would like to thank all of you for coming out today. And Kurt, it's, uh, it was really enjoyable to listen to your poems. I, I really liked them a lot. Um, I hope that we can um, do this again sometime, maybe in a smoky bar. <laughs> thank you so much. As, um, as you're probably aware, Red Hen Press is a small um, but extraordinarily busy and vibrant independent press, the best in Southern California. And um, some of the books being purveyed are over at that table. So 
Sorry Christmas isn't coming, but you could tuck it away in a drawer. Bye. <laughs>